Welcome to Navara Live. I'm Moy Lady McLean, and on this Bank Holiday Monday, I'm joined by Dahlia Gabrielle. Dahlia, hello. Hi. Hi, Moya. I'm loving the chic bob. Very classy. <laughs> From one Very bob cute. to another. <laughs> I love this. It's a bob link up. We're serving <laughs> bob. And we will also be discussing a lot of stories. And some of those tonight, we will be talking about how the Met Police have announced they will no longer be attending mental health call-outs. Additionally, a crisis is taking place in England's primary schools and Labour, for once, have announced a great policy. Food price inflation now stands at 19.1%, and that's the figure for April, and it's slightly, but only slightly, lower than it was in March, and yet still is the second highest rate of food inflation in 45 years. According to research by the Resolution Foundation, the annual food bill for the average family will be £1,000 higher by July than it was before the pandemic. And new data from the Office for National Statistics shows that about half, half of all Britons are buying less food than they did two weeks ago. Now, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is said to be drawing up plans to place a cap on the price of food staples like milk and bread. Appearing on the BBC's Sunday with Lauren Koonsberg, Health Secretary Steve Barley was asked about the scheme. What's a Conservative government doing telling supermarkets to fix their prices? It's like price controls, isn't it? Uh, That's not my understanding. My understanding is that the government is working constructively with supermarkets uh, as to how we address the very real concerns around food inflation and the cost of living, uh, and doing so in a way that is also very mindful to the impact on suppliers. Because I think we've got to be cited on the fact that many Mm. suppliers, often very small businesses, family-run businesses themselves, are under significant pressure from increased costs. And have any of the supermarkets yet signed up to this idea of having price caps on basic items? Well, my understanding based on the discussions last night is uh, this is about having constructive discussions with supermarkets about how we work together, not about any element of compulsion. But it's also being very cited on the impact of suppliers and making sure we protect suppliers who themselves face considerable pressures. Now, this scheme is said to be based on a similar model already in place in France. Over there, the price of staple foods has been capped since March, after the government agreed a deal with the supermarkets. Now, they acted when food inflation was only at 14.5%. In March, inflation for fresh food stood at 17.1%. By April, it had dropped to 10.2%. And the French government is also protecting suppliers, with the supermarkets bearing the cost of the capped prices, and with the government carrying out spot checks to ensure the suppliers aren't being squeezed. In the UK, though, Sunak's plans aren't going down well, apparently causing a split in the cabinet. One cabinet minister told The Telegraph this. There is an international market for wheat, and it is quite expensive about what's after what's happened in Ukraine. If you drive down the price of bread, it can be sold elsewhere. You can't interfere in markets. It doesn't work in this day and age. We live in global markets, and it's very different to what happened in the 70s and after the war. Now, Andrew Opie is the head of the British Retail Consortium, the trade association for UK retailers. And in a statement, he said this. This will not make a jot of difference to prices. High food prices are a direct result of the soaring cost of energy, transport and labour, as well as higher prices paid to food manufacturers and farmers. Yet despite this, the fiercely competitive grocery market in the UK has helped to keep British food among the most affordable of all the large European economies. Rather than recreating 1970s-style price controls, the government should focus on cutting red tape so that resources can be directed to keeping prices as low as possible. Why do they keep talking about the 1970s? Well, in 1972, Edward Heath's Tory government introduced price controls to try and calm spiralling inflation. And just over a year later, his party lost the election. Speaking again to Laura Koonsberg on the BBC, Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Jonathan Ashworth, said this. I want to ask you about the government's proposals, such as they are, to get the supermarkets to cap prices. Now, last time you were here, we talked about food prices. um, And you said you'd like to improve supply chains and this, that and the other. But now the Conservatives appear to be trying to freeze prices. They're actually to the left of you, aren't they? (laughs) I mean, it is extraordinary. I mean, Rishi Sunak is now like a sort of latter-day Edward Heath with price controls. But look... We've got an inflation problem, and the reason we've got such an inflation problem in this country is because of 13 years of failure where we've not invested in sustainable energy, we cut our gas storage, and we're not improving 
the labour supply. We could take measures now to get inflation under control and to grow our economy. But instead, you've got Jeremy Hunt saying, oh, we might need to go into a recession, mm -hmm. as if, you know, worklessness, unemployment, people losing their homes is a price worth paying. Okay. Government could take action now to tame inflation. Well, earlier today, I spoke to economist and host of the Macrodose podcast, James Meadway, about the significance of these proposals. They put something into the Telegraph over the weekend saying they're looking at a scheme to potentially try and limit or maybe even put a stop entirely to price rises and some basic food items. Um, but what they've also said is that this will not involve any element of compulsion. It will be a voluntary agreement presumably with the big supermarkets in particular, modelled on what the French government did earlier in the year, with also with its big uh, retailers, to say, look, uh, it would be great if you, you know, don't put up prices too much. Um, it, so it doesn't really amount to very much. The significance is that they've had to say this at all. They've had to say anything at all on this. Like, it's a really critical part of how neoliberalism is supposed to work, how free market ideology is supposed to work, that you can't control prices. This is just not a possible thing. Now, actually, we've been controlling all sorts of prices for a long period of time. There's a cap now on um, domestic energy prices. That's been in place for a good long period of time. So it's important for what it says and as a kind of statement of potential intention and possibly as a way, maybe there's a thought there to like give Labour a knock and to get ahead of them this issue, but it doesn't actually amount to very much as yet. If a price cap was to be enacted, what would it have to look like to actually make a radical difference to the passing on of wholesale costs of food? The challenge here is is to get the the kind of the balance between where the costs of all this end up and squeezing out where there's excess uh, sort of profiteering happening in the system. Because right now, if, you, if you're a farmer right at the sort of one end of the, the chain, broadly speaking, you're not necessarily going to be doing that well. Like if you're trying to grow tomatoes or something, you're having to pay a fortune to keep your, your greenhouse uh, going. You're, you're really seeing a massive increase in those sorts of costs. And then if you go along the chain a little bit further, you might well find that, well, some of the supermarkets, the evidence from Unite the Union over the last couple of years is that they've seen their profits really skyrocket uh, in this country. Now, the supermarkets right now are all saying, oh, actually, our profits aren't that big. But the Financial Times last week was showing that the markup, in other words, the amount of profit that's being made out of pints of milk has skyrocketed over the last year or so. It's up you know, a third or something like this uh, to record levels. So there's clearly some degree of profiteering let's call it that, taking place in the system, as well as this big increase of costs that has happened. So that's the increase in energy costs. And also just things like, for example, there's a shortage of coffee beans because of floods and rainfall, heavy rainfall in Indonesia. So the price of coffee has gone up. Drought in Spain has pushed up the price of olive oil to, to record highs. Uh, there are droughts in Northern Africa that are affecting wheat harvest. So these things are real shortages, but then you have profiteering on top. If you want a price cap to work, it has to squeeze out the profiteering uh, and hit the people who are making those profits and not hit the people who are actually suffering increased costs. So that means it probably, in fact, almost certainly, it's going to involve some element of compulsion and saying to people like the big supermarkets, your profits are going to have to come down. You will have to charge this much money for these basic items. Why do you think food feels like such a ring-fenced area when it comes to something like price caps? We've accepted an energy price cap. When you talk about food price caps, people start saying, oh, it's going to be like Edward Heath all over again. Why is this? No, that was Jonathan Ashworth, and I think what was a, a total hostage to fortune, although it was very silly uh, for Labour to come out and say and start to sort of mock this idea. If they want to be in government and they expect to be in government, the issues that are producing these food prices, price rises now are not actually going to go away by next year or the year after or really the rest of this century. Because the underlying thing here is climate change, it's biodiversity loss, it's how the world is changing around us. That's the really big thing we're up against. So it's daft to sit there and say, it's like Edward Heath, we'd never do such a thing. It's just silly, silly politics there. The reason I think it's such a difficult conversation in Britain is two parts. One is the relatively short term issue, which is 40 years of neoliberalism, 40 years of just being told the market is always right. It's the best, most efficient way to distribute the produce of the world to everybody and what the market says when it gives you a price, that's just how the world is and you have to accept it. So that's a really big ideological thing and people's heads about this. Can't possibly challenge the market. Don't buck the market. That's a thought that's always there. Longer term in Britain, 
for actually probably 150 years or so now. You're talking about a, a politics which has always stressed Britain as a country that can import lots of food because it can sell to the rest of the world, as a place that doesn't need to be self-sufficient in the way some other countries are. And, and we're not. It's about you know half the food we eat is imported. So that's kind of a deeply embedded part of British politics where it's like, as long as we have a free market in food, as long as we can get cheap food from anywhere, either in Britain or the rest of the world, everybody will always have, always have enough to eat. And that's been quite deeply embedded, I think, in lots of different ways in how we think about food production in this country. It hasn't always been like this. For, for a period of time after the Second World War, really right up until the 1990s or late 1980s, Britain was more self-sufficient in terms of the food it produced and what it ate. It's over the last 30 years or so that it's turned into this more kind of globalized, outward looking, import dependent version of how we get the food onto our tables. But it's quite deeply embedded and it's quite a difficult conversation to have with people about what we might need to do in a world where actually growing food in lots of different ways becomes harder than it used to be. If price caps are being considered by the Tory government, what does this say about the success of the so called free market and neoliberalism? The, the really critical bit here is that it's such a big pushback against neoliberal ideology. It's very striking that the government is in this position where it feels it has to say that. They, they have had meetings with the farm industry, the food industry, uh, Downing Street, just in the last week or so, where they are clearly getting more and more worried that although energy prices are now kind of falling out of the equation on inflation, food prices really aren't. Now, I think food prices, you can see what's happening internationally. Food prices up until recently have actually been falling a bit. With all the reports of droughts and harvest failures and everything else that's coming through at the minute, it's likely food prices will go up again. So what's going on with government is a recognition that they're going to have to try and do something that steps outside of neoliberal ideology to try and fix this. This is an important moment for us because we should be there saying, if you're going to do this, if you're going to try and protect people's standards of living to make sure everyone has enough food, to try and implement something like a right to food, as plenty of campaigners have been calling for and as we should try and think about, that means not just saying the free market will always provide. It means having interventions by government to protect people, to maybe even set or change what prices are being level, levied, and to think about how we distribute and produce food in this country in a way that if you just say the free market will do whatever we whatever it wants, it's all going to be good, that just isn't going to work anymore. London's Metropolitan Police have declared that they will no longer be attending emergency calls relating to mental health. According to the Met Commissioner, Mark Rowley, London's police officers spend 10,000 hours every month dealing with call-outs involving mental health. And a large part of that is waiting in hospitals to hand patients over to medical staff, which can sometimes take up to 14 hours. Now Rowley has demanded that health and social care services create a plan to take on mental health cases, and he's given them just 99 days to put it together. In a letter, Rowley laid out the reasons for the change. We are failing Londoners twice. We are failing them first by sending police officers, not medical professionals, to those in mental health crisis and expecting them to do their best in circumstances where they are not the right people to be dealing with the patient. We are failing Londoners a second time by taking large amounts of officer time away from preventing and solving crime as well as dealing properly with victims in order to fill gaps for others. Police forces and health bodies have been in discussions across the country about a new national policy called Right Care, Right Person, or RCRP. In a bid to relieve pressure on police forces, the scheme would see health chiefs take responsibility for mental health emergency calls unless there is an immediate threat to life. But health bosses have argued that austerity has left them without the resources to deal with many mental health cases. The RCRP policy emerged from Humberside in 2020, where police and health chiefs agreed that many mental health cases would be dealt with by primarily healthcare professionals. Now, the chief constable of Humberside Police, Lee Freeman, spoke to LBC's Sangeeta Miska about the scheme. What Sir Mark Rowley is saying is he's putting down this hard deadline because he's just got to draw a line under, under this. He wants his officers, officers to be solving crime. Did it work for your force? Are you now solving more crime as a result of entering this partnership, this new scheme called RCRP? Um, absolutely, yes. At the last full financial year, Homicide Police had the highest detection rate for crimes in the whole country. And we've moved from a force that's been in special measures to one that's rated outstanding. 
freeing up that time up and then making sure that you get back to your basics and do it well is a start and it's a it's been a real enabler for us. So the scheme worked for the police, but did it work for patients? According to His Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary, there was an improvement in patients' treatment, but, and this is crucial, mental health services in Humberside were given a funding increase, allowing them to recruit additional 24-7 staff dedicated to mental health crisis. And so far, there's been no mention of additional funding for London's mental health services. Zoe Billingham is a former inspector of constabulary and now the chair of the Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Mental Health Trust. Appearing on Radio 4's Today programme, she was a little sceptical of Rowley's plan for the Met. What do you think of this change in London? Um, I think it's potentially alarming, to be honest with you. Um, It is absolutely right that people in mental health crisis do need to be cared for in a health setting. Um, And we need to be resourced in order to be able to do that. But it has always been the job of the police, Michelle, to be the first responder uh, when your loved one, perhaps with dementia, goes missing. When a friend is in mental health crisis, there is simply no other agency to call right here, right now, other than the police. Um, And for the Metropolitan Police to potentially, as this story is being reported, to step away from those crisis calls, well, there isn't another agency to step in and fill the vacuum. So, yes, I'm alarmed. I want to see how this works through. I've seen it work well in other forces, but that's after years of negotiations and investment Mm. in community mental health services. Billingham went on to paint a stark picture of mental health services in the UK. What's being suggested, though, in the proposals that I've read about in terms of Mark Rowley's letter to social care is that it seems to to be an an almost blanket ban on attending crisis calls, not the sort of routine call that we've talked about there that you've just described, but the sorts of calls where someone maybe has gone missing is likely to be in crisis. If the police are withdrawn from that situation, nobody knows quite what danger their relative is going to be at. And frankly, there is no other phone number other than 9999 right now for people to call. So yes, over time, we need to invest in mental health services so so that mental health practitioners can turn up in those situations. But the mental health service right now is creaking. And in fact, in some places is, is, is so subsumed with demand that it's not able to actually meet the requirements of, of those that need our services most. I mean, to me, that sounds like an argument for better funding, not an argument against taking mental health call-outs out of police hands. Um, And there are other good reasons not to have the police involved. For example, their very bad habit of killing people, often black patients who have mental health problems. Ola Shenny Lewis died in 2010 after Met Police officers subjected him to two periods of prolonged restraint. Lewis had suffered a psychotic episode and voluntarily admitted himself to Bethlehem Psychiatric Hospital. Later that night, he tried to leave and the police were called. 11 officers, 11, subjected him to 10 minutes of restraint and then a further 20 minutes holding the man face down on a bed and the floor. He was also hit three times by a baton. Olesheny Lewis died of cerebral hypoxia, which is a lack of oxygen to the brain. And a coroner found that the police had used excessive force, which contributed to his death. Kevin Clark died in police custody in 2018. Suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, Clark lived in supported accommodation. And staff called the police because they feared his mental health was deteriorating. The officers found him lying in a muddy school playing field in South London after he jumped some nearby fences. They surrounded him and restrained him with handcuffs and leg restraints. And body cam footage captured Clark saying, quote, I can't breathe. I'm going to die. The coroner found that the police restraints had contributed to his death. And in June last year, Oladeji Omashaw drowned in the Thames. That was after the man who was experiencing a mental health crisis was repeatedly tasered on Chelsea Bridge. And in an attempt to escape that violence, Omashaw jumped into the river below At the time, police claimed he was holding a weapon, a screwdriver. It later turned out to be a firelighter. The Independent Office for Police Conduct refused to hold a criminal or misconduct investigation into his death. Dahlia, is this plan to take the police away from mental health call-outs a rare step in the right direction for the Met? 
Unfortunately, it doesn't really solve any of the kind of core issues that are leading us in the prop to the situation that we're in. You know, obviously, it's completely inappropriate for the police to be dealing with mental health crises. You know, I mean, the poli- the main tactics and weapons that the police have are violence, containment, coercion. There are very few, I, I would argue, there are basically no situations in which those are appropriate tools, but particularly not when we're talking about someone in an acute mental health crisis. And I think there's a really important point here to be made as well, that when we talk about, you know, there's that that we're not going to come out, that the police aren't going to come out uh, in cases of mental health crises. The question is, who is read as having a mental health crisis? You know, one of the key problems you've outlined there, Moya, is that in when it comes to a racist police force, Black people experiencing mental health crises is often read as threat or as criminalized, as something to be criminalized rather than something to be, you know, healed uh, or an issue to be dealt with in a in a in a different way. And so I think that that racial angle actually isn't really touched by this policy. And so obviously we don't want a situation where the police are dealing with mental health, um, acute mental health. Crises. This is something that we've been calling for for a really long time. But the question of who do you call or who do you reach out to is still alive and well. And in the context of austerity, when you know the demand for mental health services has gone up by 20%, but funding has gone down by 10% since 2010, we really are in Uh, in dire straits. And it's not just about the quantity of funding that is missing, but also the quality of funding. You have a situation whereby there's been over-focus and over-investment in sort of quick fix, low cost measures like, you know, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is appropriate for some people, but is not appropriate for people with complex mental health conditions. And so, in this context, if you don't fit into those kind of treatments, it's very, very difficult to get sustained treatment on the NHS. And one of the ways in which the police have actually built attachment from the public, from certain segments of the public, is by becoming the only people that you can call in a crisis. And so when you have that broader context of both a broken mental health infrastructure and a situation where the police have been routinely positioned as the only people you can call in any kind of crisis, simply withdrawing one of those things in a period of, what, nine weeks, doesn't actually do anything to solve um, the fundamental problem, which is that we don't have adequate mental health care infrastructure in this country. So really what we need is, first of all, to replace basically most of the services that police offer with more appropriate services, whether it's mental health care, whether it's housing, whatever, but also to actually focus on not only providing mental health, mental health care in the moments of acute crisis, but also to focus on building an infrastructure that has not only early intervention capacity to make sure that people are cared for before they get to the point where they're in crisis, but also to create a, health, a society that doesn't just individualize mental health as a failure of individuals, but actually understands that by creating a more connected and, you know, less precarious society, people are far less likely to reach the point of acute crisis. And so to really view this as a systemic problem, rather than something that can be addressed by just withdrawing one of the only mechanisms of albeit far from perfect, far from reasonable support within a nine weeks, um, within a nine week program. So it's one of those really weird policy announcements where in a sense, it's it, the either or are both terrible. And I guess that's what it means to live in, in Britain in 2023. The kids might not be all right. More than 90 primary schools in England are closing or face closure because they haven't got enough pupils. A Guardian analysis of government data has found that 88 primary schools in England were more than two-thirds empty last year, placing them under the threat of closure. And a further four are already scheduled to close. This is from The Guardian. 
Across England, there were more unfilled primary school places than in any year since 2009 to 2010, the equivalent to 570,000 pupils or 11.5% of total capacity. The Department of Education, DfE, is expecting the number of pupils at state-funded schools to decline by 944,000 over the next decade. The head of analysis at think tank the Education Policy Institute, John Andrew, said that the number of pupils was already starting to fall in primary schools. Here's what else he said. Pupil numbers peaked in 2019 and it's fallen by about 0.5%. In secondary schools, it will peak in the next academic year and then start to fall after that. Most of the funding that schools get is on a per-pupil basis, so when numbers start to fall, their overall funding falls. Government will still be able to say, we're maintaining per, pu- per pupil funding, but that doesn't make much difference if you're a head teacher who's lost 30,000 a year. Now, the location of these at risk schools is very interesting. You might think it's rural schools that would be in the most precarious position, but no. Nearly half the schools under threat were located in cities and towns. A quarter were in rural villages and one in six were in more isolated parts of England. Most were also in the southwest and southeast. The Guardian attributes falling pupil numbers in urban areas to declining birth rates and the high cost of living in cities and towns, which is pushing families out. Columnist Adita Chakraborty recently explored primary school closures in London, and this is what he found. A city without children is not some dystopia, it is the new reality. At the Centre for London, senior researcher John Tabush has analysed 20 years of census results and found families with kids have gone missing across the centre of London. Since 2001, Lambeth has seen a 10% drop in households with at least one school-aged child. In Southwark, it's 11%. Hackney, Tower Hamlets, Islington, they're all losing young families. Children are what Cathy Evans of the charity Children England calls an indicator species. As long as a city or a town has a good and large mix of kids, you know it will be fine. In which case, the signs from London's indicator species should worry us all. Chakraborty says the process is part of the legacy of the Tory Lib Dem coalition. If this historic shift has a hinge point, it's the 2010s when two big forces began reshaping the capital. The first came from Downing Street. Since David Cameron moved into number 10, successive Tory governments have taken benefit money from the very youngest and handed it to the oldest. The Resolution Foundation calculates that newborns have lost 1,500 a year in entitlements, while those aged 80 and above have gained more than 500. By holding down housing benefits, so it lagged far behind London rents, the supposedly centrist coalition of Cameron and Nick Clegg forced less well-off families out of the capital. They made inner London into a no-go area for the working poor and Britain into a country that steals from its future for the sake of buying a few extra votes at the next election. Oof. Dahlia. To you, what do these school closures say about the way society and our cities in particular are being reshaped? Yeah, I mean, I agree with with so much that's been said. It's obviously to do with the cost of living. It's obviously to do with housing. You know, what what how can you send your child to school in in a city London when you've just been gentrified out of your your home uh, and pushed into to wherever? I also would add to what's been said that a big part of this is the crisis of childcare. Uh, in Britain, we have one we have one of the most expensive childcare systems in the world, particularly when you compare it to the rest of Europe, where you have more so more instances of socialized childcare systems. Um, you know, childcare rates have have risen at three times the the rate of wages. That is deep. That means that we just don't have an adequate childcare infrastructure, and it's particularly bad in London, where not only is the childcare way more expensive than, you know, the weighting of London wages versus non-London wages would allow, but also the kind of broader cost of living um, is is much higher in London. So the rise rise in childcare costs is felt really, um, really acutely. So it do, it makes complete sense. And what's happening in our schools is obviously deeply connected to childcare infrastructure. Most parents can't pick up, most working parents 
can't pick up their kids at 3 p.m. or half three. They need after school clubs. Uh, they need childcare to be provided during the summer holidays and the Easter holidays. Most of the time they might have one child in school and another child who, you know, needs to go to nursery or some other kind of wraparound childcare system. So you compare the system we have where there's barely any childcare infrastructure and what is available is incredibly expensive. And you compare it to somewhere like Berlin uh, or Germany more broadly, where I think it's something like one week of childcare in Germany would barely cost, would barely cover the costs of a couple of days of childcare in Britain. So to me, that's really what this is in part about is that it is simply unaffordable. Only a very small number of people can afford to raise a young family uh, in London. And this is ultimately down to the fact that in Britain, we still very much see childcare as a private matter. You know, obviously in the 20th century, you had this like family wage system where you had this male breadwinner and he'd go out and he'd earn a wage, cover the costs of his family, and his wife would take care of the children for free and, you know, reproduce the household for free, but was sustained by the wages of the husband. Now, this isn't me and my trad wife era. It's more to say that there was that when you had both parents then moving into the, the waged workforce, into the workplace, nothing was done about the fact that that childcare infrastructure had collapsed. It was still treated as this individual private matter. There was no, in Britain, concerted policy framework um, to address the fact that this massive prov provider of childcare had now left the, the, the household. Um, and even in you know, New Labour, you know, Aditya Chakraborty talks about this as being a problem that started with the coalition government. I would actually argue that this has always been a problem because even in the so-called golden age of childcare in Britain, you know, during the uh, Blair years when we had sure start centres, we had far more um, in the way of child benefits. Yes, it was obviously much better than you have now, but still it was always, it was never fully folded into the welfare state. It was always this kind of public-private partnership where our childcare infrastructure was still subject to, you know, private profit seeking and the somewhat volatile markets. And so the fact that it was never folded fully into the welfare system, like, for example, the NHS, meant that even those small progressions that were made during the Blair areas, it Blair years in the way of childcare, were made very vulnerable to the wave of austerity that was to come. Essentially, like a lot of what happened under the Blair years, even the kind of good policies were so fragmented and so weak that it really took very little for the Conservatives to be able to completely decimate it. So to me, this is yes about housing. It's yes about cost of living. But at its core, it is fundamentally also about the crisis of childcare in this country. I think it's a really, really fascinating story. And, you know, if you read the original Guardian piece, they talk about some of the things that councils are thinking about doing to try and counteract these school closures. For example, Birmingham City Council is going to be cutting the number of school places it offers, primary school places, uh, by more than 300 from September 2024. And we talked about how this is, you know, located in the south, west and southeast primarily. Something else that's really interesting detail is that two thirds of the schools in the Northwest and the West Midlands had an increase in pupil population. I'm wondering, Dahlia, do you think what's happening is we're going to, we're seeing the hollowing out of the South and a generation that's going to be Midlands and North based? Will we see shifts of power finally when they come of age? The geography of it is really interesting because typically that's not been where internal migration has happened in this country over the past sort of 10 years. I do think that maybe the normalization of working from home has meant that more people are able to move out of London whilst particularly people in white collar work can come, kind of commute into London once or twice a week uh, and go to work, but then actually have their household um, in a place where childcare and rent, for example, is cheaper. I wonder if more people are also moving back to maybe where their family is because, you know, 
I think that the whole and childcare infrastructure is being filled largely by grandparents, you know, where, where it is being filled, it is being filled by kind of grandparents and, you know, friends and sort of community. And so, and in London, it's very difficult to live near someone that you know, because you kind of take whatever you can afford in whatever part of the city you can find it. Um, it's much harder to kind of build that rooted community in London. And so I wonder if it's also partly people moving back to, you know, parts of the country where they have more community or they have their their parents there who can kind of pitch in with the childcare and maybe a working from home dynamic there as well. I mean, I'm, listen, I say, you know, absolutely decentralized kind of power in this country, but also I do think it's important to still have infrastructure in London for childcare because you'll still have those, you know, low wage workers who have to physically be present in work because, you know, they're cleaners, they're bus drivers, they're train drivers, whatever. Um, they can't work from home and they need somewhere to send their kid as well. So we can have both at the same time. We can decenter London, but we can also make London a hospitable city. The London centric nature and the refusal to invest anywhere outside of London might ironically have sent people scurrying away from London and could lead to a decentralizing of power. But at what cost for people who still live here as well? It's, you know, with the Tories, it's very much there's a rock and there's a hard place and you can live in between it. A surprising but positive new announcement from Labour. The party has confirmed it will block all new domestic oil and gas developments if it gets into government. In the words of Drake, no new oil, no, no, no. Reports first surfaced over the weekend that Keir Starmer would formally set out the plans next month as part of his net zero energy strategy. The leak policy also includes a commitment that any borrowing for investment would be restricted for green energy schemes. A Labour source sketched out the broad outline of the plans in The Times. We are against the granting of new licences for oil and gas in the North Sea. They will do, we'll do nothing to cut bills as the Tories have acknowledged. They undermine our energy security and would drive our coach and horse through our climate targets. But Labour would continue to use existing oil and gas wells over the coming decades and manage them sustainably as we transform the UK into a clean energy superpower. Jonathan Ashworth, Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, confirmed reports while doing the media rounds on Sunday. The report that Keir Starmer wants to stop all new oil and gas exploration. Is that true? Well, what we'll be doing in our coming weeks is outlining how we want to uh, invest in the green jobs of the future to bring bills down, to create a more sustainable energy supply. We'll be outlining that in a significant mission in the, in the coming weeks and we'll be announcing more details then. But we know we've got to move to more renewable sources of energy. It's, the, it's, it's important for our climate change commitments, but it's also the way in which we can bring energy bills down for consumers. OK, that, that's interesting. Sounds very much like a, a yes, uh, Mr Ashworth. Um, and if you do stop all new oil and gas exploration with old fields being uh, shut down, uh, where does that leave your celebrated windfall tax, uh, number one? And number two, doesn't that mean that you're going to ask Britain to rely in the transition to net zero, next 30 years or so, uh, on supplies from other sources, for example, Qatar, uh, perhaps even Russia again? Uh, no, this isn't about uh, shutting down uh, uh, what's going on at the moment. We will manage those sustainably. We do think a windfall tax but can be they're applied. They're themselves to down. Be... They're not inexhaustible. If you stop all new exploration, you are going to have to fill the gap from somewhere and it won't all come from wind. We know that. The, 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 the sums have been done. So where is it going to well, come it's from? A mischaracter it's a, it's a mischaracterisation to say our policy is all from wind. We think we need to invest in... Yes, we do need to invest in wind. We need to invest in tidal. We need to invest in nuclear. We need more sustainable sources of energy supply in order to bring bills down for consumers and actually create jobs in this green transition. There are hundreds of thousands of jobs that will come online from a transition to low carbon uh, industries and technologies, not just directly in the, uh, uh, energy, in the energy sector, but associated jobs in manufacturing, in design, in engineering. We should be a world leader in this. 
And one of the things that I want to do in, when I, in the way in which I reform welfare, reform the job centres, is prepare our workforce for the next wave of jobs which is coming, the next sets of opportunities, so that we are ready for these high-skilled jobs of the future. Isn't it fascinating to see that Trevor Phillips, instead of maybe asking questions about the details of the policy or, you know, how we will become a clean energy superpower with a privatised energy system or what it actually means with these no no oil and gas developments, instead, scaremongering by saying that stopping new oil and gas development projects means we'll be on cap in hand back to Qatar or Russia. <gasps> we have to admire our neutral objective and rigorous British media, don't we? Now, this floated policy has been greeted with praise by climate campaigners, but as you saw there, the right-wing media have been going absolutely tonto. The Telegraph ran a hysterical editorial accusing Keir Starmer of being a, quote, cheerleader for a, quote, tiny, tiresome pressure group. Yep, you guessed it, they're talking about Just Stop Oil. The Times also followed up their initial reporting with an article relishing in the, quote, fury of industry leaders in the northeast of Scotland in response to the proposals. They said this. Industry, business and political leaders in the northeast of Scotland have unleashed a scathing attack on Sir Keir Starmer's, quote, deeply unserious plans to block new oil and gas developments in the North Sea. The UK Labour leader will next month outline a dramatic, quote, national mission to slash reliance on fossil fuels. This will include a ban on all new licences for oil and gas. Energy and business lobbies in Aberdeen and across the north of Scotland have said they accept the need to end reliance on hydrocarbons, but want a gradual transition to renewables. Not even in government yet. The gradual transition will happen. But you know what is really deeply, deeply unserious? Prioritising profit over the climate emergency. A reminder, back in 2021, the world's leading energy organisation, the International Energy Agency, said that new oil and gas fields must stop that year, 2021, if the world was to meet its net zero emissions goals. Guess what? That didn't happen. And now we're getting headlines like this. We can't escape the reality. France is preparing for four degrees Celsius of warming by 2100. There was also an intervention on Starmer's plans from GMB, Britain's largest manufacturing union and one of Labour's biggest donors. GMB's General Secretary, Gary Smith, isn't best pleased about the crackdown on new oil and gas field licences that once again has only been proposed. He told the Financial Times that there was a national security imperative to keep Britain's oil and gas industry alive as it's still part of the government's net zero 2050 plan. He added, It would be self-defeating not to maximise extraction from our own oil and gas, and that's going to be a difficult debate, but it's one we'll have to face down. There's ethics involved. Are we going to keep funding these regimes in the Middle East or the likes of Russia, or do we take responsibility for our own carbon and create jobs and investment here? There's no point strangling the industry. We need to work with the industry to encourage investment in the green technologies of the future. Funny, very funny, because here is Gary Smith in 2021 in a statement released alongside GMB's special report on energy and environment. Climate change is real, the climate emergency is happening, but the debate over energy and environmental policy must go hand in hand. And over the last decade, it has been mired in political and industrial failure. There's a huge gulf between our climate change ambitions and delivery. We export to the rest of the world the jobs we need to support to recovery and transition to a low carbon economy, and we give billions of pounds in subsidies for big energy to do it. That's unjust, wrong, and as a union of jobs and work, we make no apologies for calling that out. Time isn't on our side, but it's not too late to fix this. An energy sufficient and socially prosperous country is entirely compatible with saving the planet, but only if we start taking our responsibilities seriously by planning and investing in the future now. Two years ago, GMB were all in for a Green New Deal. Dahlia, what has changed? Well, I mean, it's hard to say because there's, the chances are is that there's factional battles within the GMB that will shape what these their policy or their position on these things are. I do think that it does go to show how, you know, the the culture or the kind of the political sort of the, the idea, the Overton window, I guess we'd call it, the our political imagination can change in this case for the worse so dramatically. I think for me at this point in 2023, uh, anyone who is trying to keep open an oil field and to recommission oil and gas projects is in completely discredited 
in my view, is a completely unserious person. It's simply incompatible with the continued, the the idea of evoking ethics in, in this context is completely laughable, given that the climate emergency is a threat to the lives and livelihoods of the vast majority of people on this planet, particularly the people who are economically and socially and politically Um, marginalized. So you can't really, there's no ethical case for reopening or recommissioning an oil and gas field here or anywhere else. I do think, though, that there is a really important point to be made here, particularly when we look at this from the perspective of, say, the GMB, who was talking about, you know, jobs, for example, there. Um, I do think that despite this being a good step forward from Keir Starmer, What we aren't seeing now that we perhaps did see a few years ago from the Labour Party was a detailed industrial strategy that laid out and fully costed and put timescales on exactly how people working in oil and gas in Britain, both offshore and onshore, will be transitioned into better, well-unionised, high-quality jobs in the green sector. I think in this country in particular, There's good reason that the unions feel anxious and feel mistrusting of the government or whatever, you know, whatever kind of government, Labour or Conservative, uh, when it comes to big industrial changes. Obviously, deindustrialization, the closing of the mines was a big example of, you know, this big kind of shift in the political economy of the country and the industrial strategy of the country. And what you had was these industries that communities had built their livelihoods around being closed and there being nothing in the way of making sure that those communities were still supported. They were abandoned. There was an organized abandonment of communities that had relied on the mines. And I think there's legitimate fear that as we shift towards a decarbonized economy, the same thing might happen again if it's done in an unmanaged way and in a way that doesn't have Um, justice at its heart. And so for me, I wonder if some of this pushback now is coming from the fact that we don't have a Labour leadership that is actively engaged in the unions, particularly the union rank and file, that is actively engaged in economic justice and climate justice movements and has put the policy thinking towards creating an industrial strategy that could sustainably transition workers into a decarbonized economy, because it really shouldn't be, these really shouldn't be polarized issues. You know, the, the, I think there was a survey by platform of workers in offshore oil and gas in the North Sea, and they found that 80% of workers would consider moving to an industry outside of oil and gas. And it's understandable because a lot of these jobs that we're talking about protecting are actually really bad jobs. They're really dangerous. They're really precarious. The wages are falling. They're not high quality jobs. And so there's really a lot of synergy between a climate justice and economic justice lens that would transition workers into a green economy good jobs, well-unionized jobs. A lot of those workers in oil and gas have really important technical expertise that we need in a just transition. And I think they need that security and that faith. You know, the Labour Party needs to build the the deep policy framework and the trust of the unions to ensure that this won't just be a wave of abandonment of workers. And unfortunately, despite this policy being good, Uh, Starmer has a bad track record on building deep policy and also building trust. And so I wonder if that shift in attitude is why we've also seen a shift in GMB's approach as well. But obviously, I'm sure that there's a lot of internal politicking going on in the GMB that will also explain this, you know, step backwards when it comes to climate policy. I think there's all very insightful points as well. You know, sometimes unions can suffer from short term thinking, perhaps, instead of the long term welfare workers at large depending on the factions um and god forbid i really do think the spirit of michael has entered me because i will say that we don't have the details for this policy yet because it was leaked early so we're keir starmer it remains to be seen in a month will he still be outlining the same proposals in the face of all this pushback that he's received or will he do a classic starmer u-turn and swiftly reject his radical climate plan Let's keep our eyes peeled on this one because I have a feeling it won't be going away. 
Talk TV host Mike Graham is a right-wing headbanger at the best of times. But in a clash with Labour MP Charlotte Nichols, he's now revealed himself to be absolutely brainwormed. It all began when Nichols, MP for Warrington North, posted this on social media. Big chance of fuck the Tories for at Jamie Webster 94 at BHD Weekend. And I, and I can't lie, I absolutely love to see it. Love you, Warrington. Graham did not like that, as you can see from his comment here. The classy at UK Labour MP. I'm sure Mike Graham knows about class. After a bit of online back and forth tension between the two, Graham then invited Nichols onto his show to discuss the issue. And here's how that conversation began. The reason I wanted to, to have you on, to be honest, Charlotte, is that you've talked a lot in the past about the toxicity of social media and how unfortunate things that are said on the internet can lead to problems in real life. And I thought to myself, well, hang on a minute, this is a bit of a hypocritical tweet to put out, isn't it? I don't think it is, because the sorts of things that I'm talking about are some of the conspiracy theories around vaccines, misinformation that's put out about various people. It's those sorts of things that I'm talking about. I don't think a generic chant about a political party is part of that kind of toxicity and I don't think that it can be considered an insight to violence. But don't you think that if you go around saying things like F the Tories that that will encourage people to hate the Tories and hate people who are Tories instead of thinking about what it is that that person is and what that person believes in because surely you wouldn't say that you want to uh, you know say F anybody who you don't agree with. Well, again, I think you have to consider why people in Warrington are chanting that at the moment. And it's probably something to do with the new hospital. We're now not getting the sewage that's oh, being... Oh, come on. No, it isn't. It's, something, it's everything to do with the fact they're young people at a, at a pop concert. I would expect them to chant it. I'm not having a go at them. I'm having a go at you for endorsing it. I'm saying, of course they're going to chant that. It's a bit like when you would go to Glastonbury and they're all singing for Jeremy Corbyn. You know, they're all champagne socialists. They've all got loads of money and they don't really understand the difference between tax and no tax. But at the end of the day, I would expect somebody in your position to be a bit more responsible. Well, as I said, I'm not singing it. I was reporting the fact that it was being sung. But you're and applauding it, though. I love the fact that people are blaming who is responsible for their problems rather than scapegoating people that aren't responsible, which the government's been trying to get them to do. I feel like my brain has just leaked out of my ears. <laughs> that was not the end of the exchange. Not happy with that answer. Mike Graham pressed proudly on. But you've said, I've had someone come to my office with a knife before, I've had physical violence against me, and then she says a lot of that has been whipped up by things that have been said online. Don't you think yeah. that's what you've just done? No, it has been whipped up by things that have been said online, including all sorts of grand conspiracy theories that I'm apparently part of as a Jewish member of parliament. That's a very different matter from people doing generic chanting about a political party who are in government and who have given people every reason to hate them, frankly. So you think people should hate the Tories then? I think people should hate the government, yeah. Really? See, I find that an extraordinary position for a democratic politician to have. You also said this, I think ultimately that in all of us in some form of public life, whether it's in the council chamber or the chamber in Westminster, need to be modelling a good kind of debate that is based on policies and not personal attacks. Again, show how me is where... that? How is that in any way... Um, E equal to what you've endorsed. Again, show me where it's a personal attack on anyone. It's well, you're basically, you're basically encouraging people to hate the Tories. You just said it. You just said people should hate the Tories. They should hate the government because of what the government's been well, doing. Well, should they hate Tories? Well, all right. Should they hate Tories then? Pardon? Should they hate Tories? They don't hate individual people, but they should hate the party, what the party stands so for. They should, well, should they? No, it's a simple question. Should they hate Tories? I literally have just answered your simple question. That was the moment that Graham's brain finally, finally gave up the ghost and broke into, leading him to ask Nichols this. All right, let's, oh, let's turn it around then. Let's say yeah. people said to you, um, I hate Jews, but I don't hate you. How would you feel about that? Honestly trying to say that... F the Tories is in any way comparable to anti-Semitism. No, I'm saying that you're attacking a group of people, right? And I'm saying that you're, uh, as a Jewish individual, just a member of a group of people. But if somebody said, I hate Jews, you would make that hate speech, wouldn't you? It would be hate right. speech. But so why is I hate Jews, Tories? So why is, not, hang on. Tory is not no. a protected characteristic. Well, why is I hate Tories okay and I hate Jews not okay? 
because the Tories are in government and have given okay. people reason to hate them with their policies over the last. I think that's years. I think that's a lunatic um, assessment of the reality of of the world, and it's no wonder that people go around abusing Tory MPs and abusing Labour MPs because you are encouraging that uh, environment. I'm absolutely not encouraging You should that be advice. saying to people that you should not hate individual MPs and you should not hate groups of people, surely. I have called out individual attacks on politicians from right across the political... But why do you think, if you say it's all right to hate Tories, why do you think Tories get a lot of hate? I th <laughs> we do be living in a society. The logic there is, in case you couldn't keep up, People hate the Tories because Charlotte Nichols says it's okay to. Absolutely nothing to do with what they've done to us. Dahlia, with exchanges like that, hilarious as they are, <laughs> exchanges like that, hilarious as I personally find them, is it doing anything to further political discourse in this country? My question is, has Mike Graham figured out how to grow concrete yet? Because that was the last time I saw him looking that stressed out. And intellectually challenged. Um, obviously, completely incoherent, particularly when you consider the fact that no one, literally no one, traffics in the politics of hate in the way that the Tories do and their outriders on outlets like talk TV. Except the difference is, is that hate the Tories at a festival is just a chant and it is an expression of legitimate anger at how the Conservatives have essentially destroyed everything, every part of our urban and social infrastructure have made the places that we live in hospitable for all the reasons that we've spoken about. Whereas the kind of politics of hate that the Conservatives and Mike Graham uh, traffic in actually kills people. It leads to, you know, uh, people drowning in the Mediterranean. It leads to us leaving the refugee convention. It leads to, you know, um, far right protesters uh, descending upon detention centres. That kind of whipping up of hatred against powerless people is really the thing that we should be talking about if we want to talk about the politics of hate in 2023. Um, Mike, I'm sure that Mike Graham has done endless segments um, trying to provoke hatred and anger against protesters, against Just Stop Oil protesters in particular, and would never take accountability if something actually happened um, to a protester, God forbid, of course. Um, so for me, it's just a way of, and it's this, it really like resonates with the kind of bullshit free speech stuff where free speech is weaponized as a way to essentially say, I have odious views and odious policies and want to do odious things that make other people's lives worse, particularly if they're trans people, they're black people, they're brown people, they're migrants. And I really don't want you to say anything about it that's going to make me feel bad about myself. And that's ultimately what Mike Graham's big honourable fight is. And I think actually Charlotte Nichols did a really good job there of keep, of like bringing, not getting dragged in and really drawing the conversation back to where it needs to be, which is why are young people up and down the country saying fuck the Tories? Thank you everyone for tuning in. Come back tomorrow at 6pm for another live stream, which I will be hosting once more. I'm really, really on the reserve duties this week. And remember, when you're going about your daily business, that there is a new protected characteristic out there, which is being a massive plonker. You've been watching Navarra Media. Good night. 